every second Tuesday, I host a silent reading, writing party at our meditation center here in St. Petersburg. Uh, we gather in that classroom and we silence our cell phones. We relinquish those cell phones into a wooden bowl and we bolster ourselves with pillows and cushions on the floor and we retreat into a good book. We ceremoniously begin and end that sustained 90 minutes of silence with the sound of the gong that rests in the corner of the room. And inevitably the silence that we enter into is actually not so silent. There are sounds of traffic that come through the window from outside. Uh, there are the occasional sounds of someone scribbling in their journal. There are the sounds of someone rising and going to make a cup of tea or coffee. There are the creaks and the pops and the groans of the human body that in that silence seem so loud and out of place. And at the end of each of those sessions, we share a bit about what we read or what we've written. And even those nervous first timers, those who cling to and hesitate giving up their device, and those who go wide-eyed at the sound of the gong, even them, they share an appreciation for the chance to be in proximity to others without the obligation and the expectation to speak. The average American spends more than 11 hours per day staring at a screen. Watching, reading, listening, interacting with media or interacting with one another. It's most of our waking hours. We send worldwide 23 billion text messages per day. That's 16 billion per minute. It seems that we are communicating more, but that we are communicating more silently. And any glance around the dining room of your local restaurant, once the table has exhausted all of the conversation and all of the small talk and everybody's returned to their phones, will prove that there is no longer such thing as an awkward silence. In his book, The Four-Dimensional Human, Lawrence Scott illustrates the sometimes confusing new language that we can use to describe the sensory range of digital life. Consider, for instance, he writes, the photographic meaning of digital noise as referring to a graininess or unwanted pixelation of a computerized image. And there is the concept of muting an advertisement or a text message conversation, rendering it invisible as opposed to inaudible. The official language in Twitter's 2014 announcement debuting its silencing feature read, muting a user on Twitter means their tweets and retweets will no longer be visible in your home timeline. Imagine reading that statement in 1980. Imagine reading it in 1990. And then there is the chat, whether with a family member or a coworker or a customer service representative or a robot. Chatting is something we now do in a window on our mobile device or on our desktop. Now, of course, there are options for voice chat. And as Lawrence Scott writes, this one-time redundancy, which prior to the digital age would have seemed as strange a term as, say, ear listening, <laughs> now offers a valid distinction. Chat alone no longer implies vocals. Voice chat thus efficiently suggests, in two words, how our assumptions about sound and the ways we perceive it are not what they used to be. It is in this new 
postmodern, plugged-in environment. And we must consider and give context to the value of silence and the virtues of stillness. The words fast and cleanse, usually reserved for dieting and nutrition, are now used in conjunction with media and personal screen time and the long-term effects on the body and the mind of this new way of being, this digital everywhereness, this embeddedness, are still unknown. But what is known is that deep in the heart of stillness and in the silence of solitude, there's the opportunity for reflection and contemplation and creation and growth. Seasonally and spiritually, there is a benefit to entering the darkness or the void of winter after having taken the inventory of the harvest and contemplating what to replant or to reseed. The phrase Dark Night of the Soul, first coined by St. John of the Cross, has long been used to describe the suffering of those who are grieving or of those who've chosen to dance that tortured path winding along that precipice of creation and transformation. But we all experience our own dark night. Episcopalian priest, Reverend Dr. Matthew Fox, has argued that the Neoplatonic threefold path of purgation, right? Yeah. Illumination and union is sorely antiquated. And in books like Creation Spirituality and Original Blessing, he proposes a new four-fold path. Ooh, four. Positiva, negativa, creativa, transformativa. You saw it on your bulletins this morning. They are the ways of wonder and of mystery and of creativity and of justice. And commenting on that second path, the via negativa, he writes, as divine as all creation is, the human person must learn to let go of things in order to let things be things in order that reverence might be learned things are not bad but the human propensity to cling to things is harmful and creates the dualisms that result in all sin when we let go and let be we learn new levels of trust, including trust in the dark. Trust in our experiences of nothingness, both personal and political. Consciously, deliberately moving into stillness, darkness, silence, and the void can be terrifying. We may find ourselves going wide-eyed at the sound of that gong, right? That signal for us to leap. We might freeze in the face of it. We might stand on the edge of that precipice, leaning forward into the wind-whipped emptiness and find ourselves without the courage to simply fall forward. Lucky, luckily for us, that decision uh, to grieve, the decision to transform, is rarely ours to make. It's made for us. It's made for us by God. It's made for us by the machinations of the cosmos, uh, the wind that carries us over the edge, or by the gentle or not so gentle hand of another. And Fox reminds us, there is no moving from superficiality to death. And every spiritual journey is about moving from the surface to the depths without entering the dark. Daring the dark it means entering nothingness and letting it be nothingness while it works its mystery on us. Daring the dark also means allowing pain to be pain and learning from it. Fox even offers us this commandment, thou shalt dare the dark. 
but he does so not without first instructing us through the Via Positiva. It's by first passing through and celebrating our sense of awe and wonder and gratitude and joy that we are able to enter into that darkness, into the mystery of the void. And that is what carries us through the other side, into a new season of creation and reinvention. This is the lantern that we bring with us into the cave, that burning ember, that promise of the birth of the Christ child within, that gives us hope. In his book, Religious Inquiry, Holmes Rolston writes, Algebra is an activity that one cannot watch with any notion of what is going on unless he himself knows how to do it. All those parts which one cannot do, one cannot understand. Religion is like this. Unless one can do it, what he or she observes makes no sense. So all the sacred language, all the meaning making in the world is nonsense. Unless we can survive transformation at the deepest center of our being. If we don't rise every morning and return to our advocacy and our activism, if we don't eventually reawaken from that dark night of the soul to experience more beauty, more goodness, more truth, then we are lost in the void. And our effort, our effort to survive, will be predicated on our ability to bridge the gap between understanding and undergoing. Trusting that we are the process is the process. Knowing that the question is always part of the answer, is wisdom. As the poet Rainer Maria Rilke said, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Going forward, we must not fear change. We must learn to love the unsettled and unfinished parts of ourselves. We must brace ourselves for the sound of the gong and enter into that silence bravely. We must relinquish our smartphones to the wise wooden bowl and find each other through the sharing of stories. We must carry our coffee and our tea, our culture and our technology with us into winter, knowing that we will encounter someone along the way who may be more wounded more angry than we are. We must be comforted that we will be held through every transformation, every loss, every rotation of the cosmic spiral by the steady and certain hand of faith, that this too shall pass. We must always remember that we learn by doing, by picking up and by putting down. And as we learn to test these waters, we push our chests out into the wind as we dive off the edge of doubt. We improve with every turn at rising again. We show future generations how easy it could be to grieve, to forgive, to reconcile, to rebuild. We show them how to relight and pick back up their torch of sacred work that crude hand-fashioned tool used to transport that divine spark, that spark that can illuminate the shadowy darkened corners or burn the whole thing down. And in closing, I offer this winter prayer. I ask you to repeat after me. Spirit grant me the strength to rise and relight my torch that I may build something new grant me the insight to understand and undergo my transforming ever broadening edges grant me the peace 
to love the unfinished parts within. Grant me the wisdom that comes with always becoming. Always becoming. Amen.